entering a different and man-made world now on 4. And if you want to follow this programme live via internet, please mail the code shown. Cyberspace is the new frontier. The electronic revolution led by American technology has given birth to a new community, the inhabitants of Cyberville. In Cyberville, the true believers are convinced of the global power of digitized information, and their program is to change the world. Hi, we're the Infomaniacs from Cyberville, what we commonly call the realm of information unbound, a realm of pure information, divorced from the physical world and from the media forms that shape it and give it form. Now, what is this? Is it really a place? No, we think of it more as a, a point of view, another way of seeing the world that we live in and work in and think in, another way of seeing ourselves. Come on over. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to Seagraph. The personal computer is the passport to enter this world of the internet, video games, and virtual reality. But cyberspace includes all communication through the electronic ether. It's the invisible space occupied by a phone call, a fax, or an automated cash transfer. It's not just the mind that can enter cyberspace, the body can too. New tools like virtual reality helmets, gloves and full body suits allow actual physical interaction with the world beyond the computer screen. Well, I think when we look back on the, uh, on the 20th century, um, instead of relativity, we're going to really view cybernetics as one of the really great insights that we had into the way things work. Um, cybernetics uh, was a term coined by Norbert Wiener in the 40s. He was a prof professor of uh, mathematics at MIT. And uh, uh, Norbert Wiener, even at that time, even though uh, uh, computers were just at the very uh, beginning stages of being developed, they were still vacuum tube machines, uh, still even then he foresaw uh, an age of intelligent machines, artificial intelligence, and he really drew it uh, from his understanding of feedback and evolution. Uh, cybernetics in many ways is the science of evolving or of evolution. Television is the cyberspace that we all know. Our addiction to the box is a foretaste of the immense power that lurks in the cyber communications to come. What we're doing is coming to grips with the fact that a 30-second piece of videotape of a black guy being beat by white cops down in Compton can spread itself around the globe in a matter of seconds, thanks to CNN and Skynet and everyone else, and lead to full-scale urban rioting throughout the United States. We are coping with the fact that, in a very real sense, a butterfly that flaps its wings in Compton can lead to a hurricane around the country. Here, we've created, we've created this man-made box, this, this, this piece of te technology symbolizing all of the technological 
um, innovations that have been made. And there is such worshiping going on. There is such, uh, you know, techno lust and all these things going on that I, I think people are really losing sight of where we actually come from and what is important and um, who are we. And so in that way, technology really is sort of pushing us even further away from the earth, further away from nature, further away from, from where we come from. I think one of the biggest problems is the television, because of its low bandwidth and, and, and reduced picture intensity, is less realistic and depicts an unreal uh, representation of world events and news in a very distorted way. Because if you saw a television show of the fires of Kuwait, you would have a certain effect. If you suddenly were surrounded by the fires of Kuwait on a giant screen with booming subwoofers, you would say, oh my god. Now I understand what a fire in Kuwait really was like. And you might have an utterly different sensibility about the chaos of it, or the horror of it, or the pollution of it, that would be much more affecting. Well, part of the way in which society reconnects in this um, age of fragmentation is through media. And the television offers is the medium through which we can connect to the global community. But more and more of our experiences then are becoming removed from actual social contact. Media, I think, offers this possibility of linking us socially while at the same time remaining encapsulated within our own world. Really, there's one thing going on, is what I'd argue. And that's a, I think, a renaissance of unprecedented magnitude. Uh, and it began maybe in the 1960s, partly with the psychedelic revolution. And it was predicted and mapped by chaos mathematicians and quantum physicists and enabled by the computer and new technologies. But it's being experienced now in popular culture by kids with Nintendo joysticks, by teenagers going to raves, by businessmen who compromise with the facts, but generally send their messages by email and do video conferencing. Um, we are learning to inhabit a place, what we've been calling Cyberville, a territory which is very different from the territory we've inhabited before. We are moving into what could be called a discontinuous or a chaotic reality, and the rules are very different. The chaos of America's urban sprawl belongs not just to the city of steel and glass, but also to the other city, the phantom city of media and information. With most resources directed to it, it is the cyber city which is accelerating faster than the real urban space. I think it's no accident that the tremendous uh, speed that we're seeing in development of uh, this new cyber culture, of we're wiring up the world rapidly, we're building satellite links, we're laying fiber optics. Each phone company is announcing they're spending $16 billion in the next five years to lay fiber optics and to build uh, links between the cable systems and the phone companies. And, uh, it's just, it's just a, uh, an amazing kind of neural layer which is evolving right in front of our eyes right around this millennium time. Why is that? Well, Carl Jung would argue it's not uh, happening by accident. It's the actual millennium itself making this happen. It's like an energy. It's like almost a, if you would, if you can imagine, it's like a magnet that the closer you get to it, the more it speeds up. It's almost like a black hole. So as you hit it right on the year 2000, the culture is moving at almost maximum speed. I think, in fact, we already very much live inside of virtual environments. And what's really being impoverished by this is the world of real experience and people interacting with each other. Instead of dealing with the growing problems in society and government cutbacks, and, I mean, the list is endless, what's really happening is people are focusing instead on this kind of future utopia of cyber world and cyberville and in reality 
they're leaving behind the very thing that is driving them into this world. Cyberville looks safe indeed compared to urban decay. Paranoia, violence, and pollution are eating at the soul of America, driving it inward to the protection of the home. Private security, entry codes, and video surveillance control gated fortresses. Escape into virtual reality with its email addresses, electronic identities, and home base workplaces is just one inevitable step further into the sanitized anonymity of suburbia. What developed in suburbia was a form where there was very little public life. People interacted at home and interacted in the workplace but there was actually no public realm, or very little. What's developing now is an entirely new form of controlled environment. You find mall aspects in theme parks, themed environments. These provide safe, secured environments where people can interact. It looks very much like public life, but in fact really isn't, because the environments are owned and controlled and heavily regulated by generally very large global corporations. The themed environments have no link to actual communities. Universal City Walk, a tourist attraction at Universal Studios in LA, is Cyberville set in concrete. Even locals flock to these idealized streets, modeled on real streets just a few miles away. Places like City Walk provide people with a kind of simulation of public life. The environment is heavily controlled, monitored, and filled with rules and regulations. People interact somewhat randomly, but the actual experience is entirely manufactured. All of its terms are defined ahead of time. The experience is very similar to that of going through virtual reality. While this provides a kind of vitality, at the same time, it's based on leaving behind the mess of real urban life. Everyone expects somehow that the cyber world is not going to have these kinds of parameters and controls. This is, this is extremely unrealistic, I think. The American dream is the dream of a perfectly passless place. Heightened experience and artificial reality are the latest features of postmodern architecture. This is most apparent in Las Vegas, the fastest growing city in America where more than 20 million visitors last year spent four and a half billion dollars in themed hotels, where video and VR games, magic shows, and animatronic displays are as popular as gambling. In Vegas, history is appropriated, sort of shamelessly appropriated, in a way in which the, the violence in that history is done away with. So we have a hulling of history, a historical taxidermy occurring so that we have, well, the, the beast without any of its nasty behaviors. One of the effects computers has on us is that we are no longer responsible to memory, since memory is located outside of us. And I think this may be one of the causes for the acceleration of this type of hulling of history. I think that Vegas, as with many cyber spaces, provides that context in which people are completely self-enclosed and self-informed. And that makes for the possibility of a transcendence. But of course that transcendence comes at a certain price people go into these places and almost become entombed in them for, for days on end. I've heard people tell me that they haven't seen the outside world for a week. Well, what they're doing in my estimation is they are engaging in a ritual, a sacrificial ritual of sorts, in order to gain this transcendence. And the sacrifice is this, they must risk everything. And the risk is, of, in this case, monetary, but it really is very much like the spilling of blood. And of course, it's no coincidence that these sacrifices occur 
in places of carnage and death. The Luxor is a tomb. Excalibur is, is Arthur's knight. Caesar's, of course, we all know the bloody gore that went on there. And at Treasure Island, you were ushered in after a bloody sea battle. And of course, the marquee is a skull and crossbones. I think people intuitively sense this. And this is what capitalism has been so good at exploiting, is the mythic imagination of people. As the English philosopher Alfred North Whitehead said, all advances in civilization are processes which all but wreck the societies in which they occur. But he also said, it is the business of the future to be dangerous. America is that future. Arthur's popped out to buy a television. Ah, oh, these look interesting. And naturally, he pops in for a closer look. But then, the sun comes out. Fortunately, Arthur spotted the 21S1 from Panasonic, the only TV with cats, contrast auto tracking system, which means the picture automatically adjusts to changes in light and keeps the Panasonic just to Arthur's liking. The Panasonic 21S1 with cats. I need to communicate. I need an EC. Until now, lighted watches used to be dull. Come out of the dark age. Indiglo Nightlight by Timex. Missed the ferry? Missed the wedding? Not with sharp view cam. Film from awkward angles. Instant playback with sound. Sharp view cam. More than just a camcorder. I can, you can, we can. View cam. If you buy a Mercury one-to-one -one between now and Christmas Eve, you get an extra present on Christmas Day. You can call anywhere in the world absolutely free. It's our way of saying thank you for choosing Mercury one-to-one. -one. Happy Christmas. through with Foster's Ice for a clean, crisp taste. Washing up getting you down? <laughs> then save time and money with a Zanussi AquaSafe dishwasher. And for the perfect finish, we only recommend finish. Zanussi, the appliance of science. Malibu, the sun always shines when it pours. Parfum Chopin invites you to journey in the footsteps of a thousand and one nights to a land that awakens passion. Kashmir, this is the woman. Kashmir, this is the fragrance. The big question is, who will control cyberspace? In cyberpunk fiction, hackers outwit the corporate bosses. In reality, the battle is being won by the barons of mass entertainment, who are encouraging a new kind of consumer one who spends at the push of a button. I think we're at a point now where we could probably look back on shopping malls as almost at the brink of their obsolescence and uh, 
partly because the new electronic technologies that bring goods and services, information, data, entertainment, all of those things that the shopping mall could have provided, bring those services and goods into the home, the shopping mall is no longer necessary. And so I think we've entered into the sort of next realm of the ele electronic mall, if you will, or a form of virtual shopping. A shopping mall is where people gather to check out what's happening in fashion and entertainment. It offers many rewards, but it can also offer the search for a parking place, a battle with weekend crowds, and it closes at nine. In the Bag is a new shopping experience where the technology of virtual reality transforms the traditional mall. If we think about how uh, in-home shopping uh, can operate and is operating now, um, it um, takes uh, women back into a kind of retreat to domesticity. So what was like a century uh, of agoraphilia, uh, kind of uh, love of the marketplace, has probably turned into a new form of agoraphobia, where the home shopper is you know, now uh, back at home, uh, not in the urban social realm and pretty much a kind of um, uh, circuited victim of her own uh, sort of limited access to the world. This sparkling diamond attic necklace is like those worn by many sophisticated European fashion models, the kind that insist on stink not deodorant. If you'd like to make a real gem of a connection with European sophistication, why not order this necklace now? The subject who is subjected to the barrage of visual images, the cornucopia of eye candy that um, uh, is part of our everyday life in, in contemporary culture is uh, really the perfect consumer. Uh, reflexively responding to uh, a barrage of visual stimuli. And uh, in a society of spectacles, it's not just the image that's used to sell products, but the image itself is the product. This gold-plated bust of our most remembered president will be the envy of all those you wish to impress as a constant reminder of your association with prominent members of New England society. The JFK bus creates a slogan that fits with your sophisticated taste. And there's still a few left. Why not pick up that phone and call now? The greatest fear in advertising is losing control of what we put in. It's a propagandized message in 30 seconds, let's say. If you give them more, are you losing control? My answer is no. I think that you find that if you inform people, the more information you allow them to have, Actually, the more they're able to control a, a thought process, which ends up with a decision. And that decision is to buy this or this. Given less information, they're less likely to make no decision. The other problem that people talk about is we are finally implementing the ultimate consumer nightmare. People will push the pizza button on their remote control and buy the pizza. All of our shopping habits will be known when we go through the checkout at the grocery store. They'll look at every product, they'll know everything we buy, and then they'll appeal to that directly. So what? Isn't that the point? A consumer culture can work, and what's the problem if they begin appealing to real human hunger? Rather than telling us what products we want, we are dictating what products we want, and they have to follow suit. When you talk to the big moguls, the guys getting involved in multimedia because they know how things are going, these are people running in front of a cart that's already in motion. The people, the CEOs running the companies are not the dominators of culture. We, the individuals, are the dominators of culture, and they are our servants. They are slaves to the dollar. What the hell is going on? Major Stewart, you getting this? Affirmative. Commander Crane, unidentified flying objects approaching Earth. Off their approach vector and sound red alert. Uh, oh my God. There are thousands of them. It's easy to look at um, some similarities between Hollywood and uh, the video game business. It's also easy to find some differences. A movie or a television show is a story. A story has exposition, conflict, and resolution. And the emotional power for the viewer is in that arc. A video game is a different experience. A video game is about competition and mastery, and it's about winning and losing. And what drives a player through a video game isn't a story, although 
the, the environment of a story, you can make it more interesting. What drives a player through is a desire to master the game and to win. I just hope that the kid can cut it. I believe that a kid raised with a joystick in his hand has a fundamentally different appreciation for the image on the screen than you or I do. This is a kid who knows that the image on the screen is up for grabs, that he has been empowered to change the picture on the screen. It doesn't sound like much, but when you realize the television is the last phase of conceptual domination of culture, that people have mindlessly and numbly accepted the image on the screen as reality, that a kid who knows that he can change it, that he can make it, is a very empowered human being. So the real question, I think, for the video game business is how can we avail ourselves of the technology and the, uh, the benefits that Hollywood has to offer without losing sight of the fact that people play video games. They don't play stories, they play games. This isn't a game, Lieutenant. When you go see a movie, even a violent movie, it's a social experience. You are, you're in a theater with many other people, you're watching violence that might be disturbing, but it is still somewhat removed. Uh, now, when you're playing video games, that's a very intimate experience. It's very one-on-one. -on -one. It's, um, you know, you have to, to, to play it well, you have to believe that you are this character and you are committing these horrible acts of violence. Girls tend to like games that are less uh, linear. They like non-linear games that um, have different ways of solving problems, not just one specific set way. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't that many games being produced um, with, that, with that sort of nature to them. A lot of them are, you know, combative, very violent. I think the, um, unconsciously, what's going on behind the question sometimes is, uh, is there some, some kind of sexism on the part of the industry or on the part of the players? My own experience is um, even the most sexist businessmen are not sexist when it comes to taking people's money. One of the problems we've been looking at is girls in cyberspace. Many people think that girls don't want to be in cyberspace, but we have not had that experience. They we do. think they do want to be in cyberspace. Absolutely. Having a female protagonist is a really important thing. One of the great games is Kyrandia 2, The Hand of Fate. The heroine is female, she changes her clothes, she solves problems, she's smart, she's strong. There's actually a dippy little guy that she keeps helping out of trouble. The girls love it. There's no problem with having girls entered in, in cyberspace. They just don't want to kill any more than they do in real life. You're doing just fine. I don't think that catharsis explains what happens in front of these video screens. It has more to do with a continuous cycle of death and resurrection. And through this, the children, kids, experience a sort of immortality where they are suffering all the violence visually of death, but yet somehow they are above death. And that's what keeps them putting quarters into the machine, a resurrection for each quarter. You've achieved your second mission objective by clearing Giza of all alien forces. Kids are now being fed things. They are being fed, OK, this is the game that you're playing. This is the limited structure in which your character exists. This is what you are specifically directed to do. Um, they're not outside. They're not in a, what I would call a truly interactive environment. Um, there is a very linear path of what they are doing and how they are supposed to get there. And um, I think that's, that's really running a grave risk um, and a great danger. It's going to be a great danger to society as these children mature. Great work. Right now, the way that a lot of the technology is being used, like a lot of the games that I see are um, like kill, a lot about killing the other person or competing and it's just like, um, to just really violent, like just blowing things up and just a negative energy that I don't 
want to put myself into. Um, like when I put myself into virtual reality, I want to put myself into a really beautiful space that makes me feel really good and open up and see things in different ways. Whereas um, the way that a lot of it's being used is just like kill, 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 like, and it's like training you to be put in this very intense mindset that doesn't feel good to me. The first reaction of many people to the idea of computers being involved in the creative process is abhorrence. It's something that they just don't think can be done because the idea of creativity and expressing profound human emotion is an area that most people feel machines can play no role. Nothing. Send. Deliver. Bookkeeping. Company. Goes. More. Hour. Well. Can. The interesting thing about the CD-ROM and the technology is that it, it's cheap enough to like produce these yourself that, that it might lead artists in a direction where they can uh, produce their own work and not have to take it through a filter of a large company. Well, well, well. And not have to be involved with, you know, these people from big companies who are usually jerks. So on this screen, one of the things you can choose is uh, work that I did in Texas. You get here, you see things that I did from 1980 to 1985, which were mainly comic books. And chiefly among them is uh, Tex Hitler the fascist gun in the West. And you can just pick, you know, an episode to look at. The important thing about CD-ROMs is that they're cheap enough to keep in the hands of individuals, and it's, it's important to keep corporations from taking control and basically making everything bland in order to sell more. It mainly relies on the fact of people not selling out, and, and they, they can do this. They can create a, an alternate you know, structure that, does, that doesn't rely on, you know, people with money to, to make it work. This is a performance installation known as Voice Dancer. I am the voice dancer, an alien creature. A video camera is watching my movements and giving information about my performance to a computer. This information is projected onto a screen and I'm magically transformed into a voice dancer. This creature mirrors my movements so completely that at times I'm not sure whether I am myself or whether I am her. And I do not know if I am watching her or if she is watching me or if in fact we are the same flowering, living, breathing. Being. Interesting thing about digital technology, I think, is not so much what a lot of people are talking about, which is the information superhighway and multimedia and the revolution going on in communications, but the ability that digital technology will provide to totally transform the process of creativity, where computers become creative partners in the creation of music, art, and new sorts of things like virtual realities. It's not something new, this is something that was already anticipated by Lady Ada Lovelace in the early 19th century, the uh, daughter of Lord Byron. She was a companion to uh, Charles Babbage who invented the concept of computer technology. And she envisaged already a machine that could compose music. Now it was over 100 years before we had the ability to actually do that with computer technology, it was in the 1950s. But uh, what's happening now is a revolution in creativity where computers are composing music, they are painting pictures, they are creating virtual realities and virtual worlds, and again, transforming the process of creativity. We're at a stage where it was like uh, a few decades ago when the uh, electric amplifiers and electric guitars and such were first coming out. That allowed the creation of a new type of ensemble, the rock and roll band didn't exist before that because the technology wasn't there for four people to make that kind of noise. Well, the same thing has happened to us now. In the 90s, the computer technology is finally here where four people in real time can create images which used to take days in a large studio and lots of people. And 
And what we're trying to do with Master Masters is create a new type of performance medium, and that's live computer graphics ensemble performance. Uh, there are fi five of us, uh, three of us run computers, uh, one of us mixes the computers together, the computer-generated images together, and then one does sound. I'm the audio component of the Raster Masters. I use four CD players, a turntable, a cassette deck, and a DAT machine. I mix in quadraphonic, and I really try to relate to what I see on the computer screen in front of me. What we do is we mix the music and the visuals together as a singular component, as a group. And that's the basis of the Raster Masters, is really an interactive experience going on between the group and the audience. Metaphorically speaking, I am the visual sorceress for the Raster Masters. I act as a medium through which the Raster Masters visual dance becomes a part of the audience experience. I'm looking for things that are fun and exciting and, and creative and beautiful, really, for me to see. And it's turning out that other people kind of like it, too. It's all generated live in real time. I mean, we're actually, it, we're, we've created programs that we play like instruments during the performance. That means that we can react to what's going on in the audience. If somebody screams out there, we know that they're having a good time. We'll do it again, you know, and then maybe they'll scream again. That's kind of the idea. One computer can feed into another computer, which can feed yet into yet a third computer, providing multiple levels of transformation and a type of image complexity that has really never before been seen live. What we're trying to do here is, is sort of pioneer uh, interspecies communication uh, on, by testing it on members of our own species in uh, our concerts. It's going to be a completely wild ride. By the year uh, 2012, everything's going to have just turned completely upside down, and we're not even going to know where we are. But uh, it's going to look something like what is going on up there, but uh, about 10,000 times more intense and at resolution that we can't even imagine. Technology is not being used to enhance the individual, the way people saw it being used. What technology is being used to do is to break down the walls between individuals and enhance our status as a colonial organism. I went to Seattle to a neighborhood called the Capital District, and they had set up two or three computers and about 12 chairs, hoping they could attract inner city gang kids to learn about the internet, to learn about getting online. Well, 200 gang members came to this meeting. There weren't chairs for anyone. Kids who can't read or write English yet and who want to learn to read or write English now because they feel, again, invited for the first time to participate. These kids were, were spouting Farrakhan, saying English is the language of the oppressor. So that's why we didn't learn to read and write it, because why should we learn the language that's being used to keep us down? And now, because of the internet, they want to learn how to read and write so they can get online and express their points of view. Developed by the US military 25 years ago, the internet is a community of subscribers who can talk to each other anywhere in the world for the price of a local phone call. True confessions of a cyberspace citizen on the internet. Use it to make new friends. You find yourself behaving differently on the internet than you would in real life, what we call RL. Uh, for instance, um, in real life, I speak loudly, I'm assertive, I'm kind of an A-type personality, uh, extroverted. And on the internet, um, I'm speaking slower uh, and more softly. I won't type in uppercase uh, letters because when you do on the internet, that's considered to be shouting. Exclamation marks, shouting. I'm speaking that way now to you, but that's not necessarily my personality on the internet. The reason why there is a difference, we let down our guards. You cannot prejudge somebody because you can't see them. Uh, we have an inundation of new users that are slowing down the internet because of the amount of traffic it's handling now. You can't really filter it or control it. Because the internet was designed to um, 
to survive a nuclear blast, it's self-healing. So if you take a chunk away, it will reroute itself and basically clone the new part that's missing, and boom, it's back online, and that's it. So it is an organism in that fact. I have to say that I'm sorry that the internet's getting congested, but on the other hand, I'm very happy that it's becoming a service to mankind and that it's having people communicate and sort, sort out their differences on a one-to-one -one level or on a one to 10 million level. You have both those options. What the internet does is create a series of passages, really a uh, almost a technological womb that we can climb in. You can talk to any Freudian or even any transpersonal psychologist and they'll say that what a person does from adolescence on is try to recreate a womb to go back in. But what we're doing now is rather than doing it as individuals going in our own personal wombs and cocoons in suburban homes is we're creating a womb for culture at large, for civilization. And I think that's a uh, potentially beautiful thing. I think that one of the great arguments that goes on, and it's, it's kind of an argument that's grown out of television, is are we creating more couch potatoes, people who will be 12 inches away from a video screen, more and more isolated and asocialized. And I think that people like myself who have been involved in this medium for a long period of time try and look at it in another way, or at least our obligation, which is the process of socialization. The asocialization, the, the, the decay of the inner cities, the loss of our roots, of our tradition is not unique to Americans. We find it in China, we find it in India and in South America, we find it all over the, the world. And if we can reach out and communicate on an internet or some net yet to be named, I think that in a sense we are creating the very socialization process that we once thought we had, we certainly mourn but I think that we can give, give to it a rebirth and an excitement like maybe we've never seen before. Okay, one of the things that I like about, I guess, the net is that it's um, very boundaryless and it takes away a lot of the stereotypes people may have about people's age or their race or their sex, um, whether they're male or female because it's pure on a communication level of ideas and um, knowledge the person may have. Because there may be a person who is, say, seven years old who may know a more about a different subject than somebody who is 70 years old. Well, you know, it just depends because maybe the idea is something new that they haven't learned about in their lifetime. These kids aren't mind boggled. These kids are natives in a land where the rest of us are immigrants. And these kids speak the language like natives and speak it better than you or I can ever hope to. This is their culture. We may have built it, but this is their culture. And I think it's we who have to look to them for how to navigate our course through this terrain, not they who should be looking to us. People have very bad trips about Cyberville. And usually, they have this bad trip a moment after they've experienced the euphoria of the net. Well, I'm here to say that everything is going to be OK. A drug experience is an experience that I think simply take you out of the, they take you out of reality. They may, for a moment, give you some altered reality or an LSD trip or an experience or something, which can be positive or negative. But while you're there, you're gone. You're, you're, you're hopelessly lost. You have no volition about your location in time and space. Whereas I think through media, which is non-invasive either, you haven't ingested it, you haven't injected it, you haven't done anything um, chemically irresponsible to your body or to your mind. You're simply using your eyes, you're using your ears in a more expanded way to perceive things in a richer way or to go into uh, a way to actually consciously look at something that would otherwise be more of an unconscious or a dreamlike experience. We're uh, looking at a, at a model right now for the whole AIDS virus. And inside the AIDS virus actually are two protein molecules 
what's called reverse transfer. The exciting thing about these uh, new uh, cybernetic uh, realities, what we're calling artificial realities or virtual realities, is that um, uh, we build them using computers and uh, they recreate the experience of uh, being in what we call the natural world. You have stereoscopic vision, you have uh, directions you can look around in, you can raise your head, you can look around in the virtual world, and uh, it's completely uh, a separate reality. It's not anything like you've ever experienced in your life, growing up as a child and living on Earth. And yet, you experience it as a real world, just the way you do in your dreams. So uh, these alternative worlds, or these alternative realities, are really a new creation. Maybe the Earth itself was a creation. The Aboriginal people in Australia uh, have a term which they call the dream time. And they say that before we had this kind of consciousness, which we call waking consciousness or daily consciousness, that we actually existed in something that they call the dream time, where things flowed more and animals became people and people could speak to animals and it was a much more like the world of our dreams. I mean, perhaps at one time uh, humanity really lived in what, what is now the dreams and what we call waking consciousness may have been a new invention, just like virtual reality is to us now. Well, consciousness, of course, uh, can be seen from uh, um, a billion different perspectives, uh, as rightly so. But uh, you can imagine what a priceless commodity it is. Uh, if it's viewed by industry, it's viewed in a certain way. Uh, if it's viewed by, by uh, developing human race that, are, that is theoretically evolving to a higher plane, which, which it seems to me that the world at this particular juncture in time seems to be heading that way using technological means to hook everybody up, uh, you are actually altering the consciousness of the planet, however corny or new agey or mystical that may sound, you are, you are creating a new entity that, that thinks and feels and reacts and interreacts on a higher level. And our consciousness, for that matter, is already out there. There are literary metaphors and cyber metaphors like cyberspace and uh, the matrix and the net. Uh, Noosphere, Gaia, whatever you want to call it, it seems to me that one thing we're certainly beginning to realize today that the planet, with all its hookups, whether it's technological or interpersonal, whether it's online or offline, uh, there's almost uh, what, it, what you might describe as a mental envelope that's surrounding the planet. It's practically a, a, a physical one. And we're all tapping into it in one way or another. And it's also feeding back to us. So the, the idea of downloading consciousness, it can be from person to person, but it can also be from planet to person and from person to planet. There, there is a, a contingency of people who are very, very, you know, adamantly and excitedly e exploring the, the issues of, you know, how you can literally jack yourself into computers and communicate, have sex with somebody who could be thousands of miles away based on, you know, gizmos that you can strap on and hook up. And I mean, if, if this is what's you know, <laughs> turning people on, then that's fine. I mean, it's. I think that the connection between sex and technology can be very liberating. A lot of people view technology as cold and inhuman and alienating, but I think it has a great potential for communication, and uh, particularly in the sexual realm, which is very liberating. My definition of what is cybersex is, is pretty generic, but it's any time a machine comes between you and your orgasm. To me, that's cybersex, right? So uh, there is no uh, futurist machine that's going to give you uh, a bigger, better, faster orgasm. Probably the clearest example I found of how difficult it would be to simulate human physical intimacy is the kiss. Imagine how complicated it would be to simulate a kiss, which is probably, you know, kind of the, the building block of uh, all, you know, erotic intimacy. I think a lot of this new technology can encourage people 
not to avoid relationships, but to get in touch with their own sexuality and find out what it is they want and to find other people who share those, those same ideas. And uh, you, know, you don't need to move to a big city to stop feeling like a weirdo. Now you can just kind of you know, fly into cyberspace. Well, I think the, the notion of the, 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 the communal colonization of cyberspace, if you might want to call it that, the ability of you or me or millions or thousands of other people to enter a common imagined space is probably a great idea. And we would all very much like to do that. We'd probably get a lot out of it. Uh, I think it only becomes a bad idea if it becomes socially irresponsible. If we do it to escape from real social relationships and, and the realities of our families and our lives and our friendships and our responsibilities in life. If we look back in history, uh, we'll see that this is just a very, very natural thing to have happen. Because if we look back to, uh, to earliest, uh, our earliest records of uh, humans living on the planet, uh, they organized themselves around a particular kind of technology. At that time, uh, it's, it's always centered on how are we going to live. And so my guess is that the mayor of Cyberville uh, is going to be uh, really a group of people, but uh, the people that are going to be, maybe have the, the best insight into it uh, may end up being women. We obviously have to do away with war. We have to do away with our territoriality. The good news is cyberspace is big. It's basically infinite. The Earth is limited. It's finite. Cyberspace, if you don't like it, you can move on out to the next frontier. There is an always another continent in cyberspace. So for those males that really just have a very, very difficult time giving up their territoriality or their competitive nature, and it may take us five or ten generations to evolve up to the next level. We've got a wonderful era, era of cyberspace and we can create these in, incredible virtual reality games that really let all of that impulse play itself out. So um, I'm very, very hopeful for Cyberville because I think uh, it will leave the Earth uh, uh, in a more uh, honored and tender place. What we're doing is slowly learning to realize that we can liberate ourselves from the parent God. That's why there's such an uproar. That's why Cyberville is such a dangerously disorienting place for people to live, because they're going to have to use their own inner compasses to direct themselves, rather than the illusion of parental control. It's not uh, a simple transition. We don't know how to live in this world yet. This will be a new world. Our grandchildren will understand how to live in it fine. We're the bridge generation. We're the generation that's living at the Millennium Crossing. This is our time on the planet, and we are the missing link between the past and the future. We're the, we are that species which is creating a new reality, pretty much the way that the pe species previous to us have done the same thing. I mean, in three and a half billion years, we've gone from unicellular life forms to sitting here talking about unicellular life forms and looking back down this tremendous fossil record, which just shows our evolutionary development uh, on this uh, you know, great adventure called Life on Earth. A transcript for Once Upon a Time in Cyberville is available via the internet. For access details, please